Let us now see the microscopic uh, features of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So if you see over here, okay, if you see over here, what is this entire thing? What are these things that we are watching over here? Yes, so these are actually the follicles. These are actually the follicles that we can appreciate over here. Okay, so these are the uh, lymphoid follicles that we see in this case. And can you appreciate an area which is little bit lighter? Okay, this is the germinal center. This is the germinal center. So these lymphocytes inside, they are actively proliferating in the germinal center. Now very important, you can see this is the residual, this area. This is the residual atrophic, residual atrophic thyroid follicles thyroid follicles and in between can you see this is the classical lymphocytic infiltration predominantly these are t lymphocytes these are t lymphocytes good morning and welcome back myself dr jibran amar presents to you simply pathology and today we are back with an important video today we are going to read about thyroiditis okay so in today's topic of discussion, we will discuss the different types of thyroiditis like Hashimoto's granulomatous subacute lymphocytic thyroiditis. So what is thyroiditis? It is a diverse group of disorder which is characterized by some form of thyroid inflammation. There are four main types. One is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Then we have granulomatous or de Corvain's thyroiditis, subacute lymphocytic thyroiditis and acute thyroiditis. So let us first start with autoimmune thyroiditis. Let, let us try and understand what is the meaning of autoimmune thyroiditis. So basically they say that autoimmune thyroiditis, they have two extremes or two ends. One end is marked by Hashimoto's and lymphocytic thyroiditis, also called as autoimmune thyroid disease. And on the other end, we have what is called as Graves disease. Now these two ends sometimes they share features and may evolve into each other. That means Graves may give rise to Hashimoto's or Hashimoto's may give rise to Graves sometime. So the important example of this is called as Hashi toxicosis. It is an immune mediated insult to the thyroid follicular cells that will initially lead to diffuse nodular hyperactivity of the gland. That means initially there will be Graves disease and eventually it is going to lead to exhaustion high, uh, atrophy manifested by diffuse oxyphilia or Herthel cell change of follicular epithelium. What is Herthel cell change? We will discuss later on in this lecture. So what are the common features of autoimmune thyroid disease? That is we are talking about Hashimoto's thyroiditis and lymphocytic thyroiditis. So the common features of autoimmune thyroid disease are the presence of lymphocytic infiltration and number two, the presence of germinal center formation. Now, depending upon how the intervening follicles are, okay, the diagnosis can be made. So if the lymphocytic infiltration or germinal center is there, then it is an autoimmune thyroid disease. Now, if the intervening follicles are diffusely hyperplastic, then you have to go for a diagnosis of Graves disease. If the intervening follicles are completely normal, then the diagnosis of lymphocytic thyroiditis have to be made. If the intervening follicles are severely damaged follicles showing extensive oncocytic change, then the diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis will be made. So one thing we have to understand, okay? So uh, in case of autoimmune thyroid disease, if the parenchymal damage is limited, then it is reflecting lymphocytic thyroiditis. But if there is marked parenchymal damage, over here parenchymal damage means the damage of the thyroid follicular cell. If there is a marked uh, parenchymal damage, it is pointing towards Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So with this basic concept of autoimmune thyroid disease, we are now going to start with the first important thyroiditis that is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is also called as a Struma lymphomatosa. Now it is characterized by autoimmune destruction of the thyroid gland which is gradual in nature ultimately leading to thyroid failure. Now females are more affected middle aged females around 40 years of age. Now there is a characteristic enlargement of the thyroid gland which is diffuse firm symmetrical thyroid enlargement. 
Now, it may be preceded by a transient thyrotoxicosis. As I told you, that Hashimoto's and Graves represent the two ends of autoimmune thyroiditis. So, they share certain common features. So, sometimes Hashimoto's thyroiditis may be preceded by a transient thyrotoxicosis and this condition is called as Hashitoxicosis. Now, eventually, hypothyroidism is going to develop gradually. Now, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in areas of the world where iodine is sufficient. It is most prevalent between 45 and 65 years of age and it is most commonly seen in women. If you look at the pathogenesis of Hashimoto's disease, it occurs due to the breakdown of self-tolerance to the thyroid autoantigens. Now, abnormalities of the regulatory T cell that is called as the TREC cells or exposure of normally sequestered thyroid antigens have also been proposed. Now, there is a very strong genetic component associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis uh, and along with that, there is an association with HLA DR3 and DR5. Now, polymorphisms in CTLA4, PTPN20T and interleukin-2 receptor alpha, they are associated, you know, polymorphisms of these particular uh, genes which are normally associated with the regulation of T-cell response, these are associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So, polymorphisms in CTLA4, PTP and 22 and interleukin-2 receptor alpha genes are associated with the pathogenesis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis and normally these genes are associated with the regulation of T-cell response. Now, not only over here in many other disorders which are associated with breakdown of self-tolerance like Graves disease, uh, type 1 diabetes, mellitus, myasthenia gravis, SLE, Jogren syndrome, they might also show this same polymorphism in CTLA4, PTP and 22 intel interleukin-2 receptor alpha. Now, thyroid autoimmunity is associated with progressive depletion of the thyroid follicular cells and replacement of the thyroid parenchyma by lymphocytic infiltrates and fibrosis. Now, multiple immunological mechanism has been proposed for the pathogenesis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So, what are these mechanisms? Let us try and understand. So, the first important role is that of CD8 plus cytotoxic T cells, which directs the destruction of thyroid follicular cells. The second is the role of CD4 plus T helper 1 cells, which will release interferon gamma that is going to activate the macrophages and then it is going to lead to thyrocyte injury. So, this type of injury is also called as cytokine mediated cell death. Lastly, there is a role of antithyroid antibodies, which includes antithyroglobulin antibody and antithyroid peroxidase antibody. These are classically present in Hashimoto's thyroiditis and can be asked as an MCQ. These antibodies, they bind to the thyroid follicular cells and they might be recognized by the natural killer cells. And they might lead to cell death by a mechanism that is called as antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. Okay. Now, these antibodies, if you see, these are antithyroglobulin and antithyroid peroxidase antibodies. Now, if you look at the morphology, if you look at the morphology of uh, your uh, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, so grossly what you will see that there is a diffuse symmetric enlargement of the gland. Now, the gland is having a firm consistency. It is not stony hard as it is seen in Riddle's thyroiditis, which is one differential diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Again, there is no extension of the disease process outside the gland. Now, the extension, contiguous extension is seen in case of Riddle's thyroiditis. So, again, a, a point of difference from Riddle's thyroiditis. The cut section, if you see, for Hashimoto's is friable. It is vaguely or distinctly nodular or micronodular, yellowish gray in color, very much resembling hyperplastic lymph node. Uh, necrosis and calcification is absent. So, this is the gross image of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. As you can see, the cut surface of the Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, you are having a vague nodular appearance as we can see over here. And the appearance is very much reminiscent of hyperplastic lymph node. Coming to the microscopic examination of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the two important abnormalities that has to be studied for diagnosis is, the first thing is there is a lymphocytic infiltration of the stroma. Very important finding. The second thing is that there is evidence of damage to the thyroid follicular cells and this damage to the thyroid follicular cells is expressed in the form of oxyphil or herthal cell change. Uh, 
Now, Hartle cell change means what? That the thyroid follicular cells, they have abundant amount of eosinophilic granular cytoplasm. And this change from the normal thyroid follicular cell to oxyphil or Hartle cell change, it is said to be a metaplastic response to the constant irritation and constant damage by the T-cells. So remember, if the thyroid follicular cells normally be like this, then Hartle cell means the cell is going to enlarge okay and they are going to have eosinophilic cytoplasm and which is granular in nature so granular eosinophilic cytoplasm will be seen this is called as Hartle cell change and it is basically a response a metaplastic response to constant injury by the uh, by the uh, immune system now what are the other features that we will see under the microscope we will see large lymphoid follicles with prominent germinal center uh, now, uh, basically the lymphocytes are predominant and it is the T lymphocytes which are predominant. Now, the lymphatic vessels are also increased in number and they are dilated resulting in what is called as cracking spaces. Most of the thyroid follicles, they become small and they are atrophic in nature. Most follicles, they are lined by variably sized oncocytic or Hartle cell which is an evidence of damage to the thyroid follicular cells. Sometimes you can see squamous metaplasia. So you will see squamous nest and duct like structures which arise from metaplasia of follicular cells as a response to chronic inflammatory injury. Now the classic Hashimoto's disease if you see they will show interstitial connective tissue will be increased and they will be abundant. So there might be a lot of fibrosis. But remember that this fibrosis they do not extend beyond the capsule of the gland. Let us now see the microscopic uh, uh, features of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So if you see over here, okay, if you see over here, what is this entire thing? What are these things that we are watching over here? Yes. So these are actually the follicles. These are actually the follicles that we can appreciate over here. Okay. So these are the uh, lymphoid follicles that we see in this case. And can you appreciate an area which is little bit lighter? Okay, this is the germinal center. This is the germinal center. So these lymphocytes inside, they are actively proliferating in the germinal center. Now very important, you can see this is the residual, this area. This is the residual atrophic, residual atrophic, thyroid follicles thyroid follicles and in between can you see this is the classical lymphocytic infiltration predominantly these are t lymphocytes these are t lymphocytes coming to the next diagram if you see so i have shown this classical diagram over here that uh, uh, if you see over here okay this is again a lymphoid follicle as we can appreciate over here and if you see in the center over here that we can see is the prominent germinal center prominent germinal center that we can appreciate now also if you see if you see over here this area this is basically comprising of atrophic atrophic thyroid follicles and very importantly if you see they are eosinophilic and granular so basically they are showing the classical Hartle cell or oxyphil or oncocytic change oncocytic change which is characterized by increased eosinophilic granular cytoplasm now in this particular condition as we can appreciate there is a classical cracking like space as we can appreciate over here okay there is a cracking like space there is a cracking like space which is basically nothing but the dilated lymphatic vessels that we see in Hashimoto's thyroiditis now this is another image which is uh, basically showing an extensive amount of fibrosis that we see extensive amount of fibrosis that we see these are the areas which are also showing what is called as a squamous metaplasia squamous metaplasia and you cannot see uh, the thyroid follicles because most of them have become atrophic they have become atrophic 
Coming to the clinical features of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it is characterized by a painless enlargement of the thyroid gland. And there is a diffuse symmetric enlargement, which is a very important MCQ. Now, the patient is going to develop hypothyroidism gradually. But remember, in some cases, initially, there might be thyrotoxicosis that we call it as Hashi's toxi Hashi toxicosis, characterized by increased T3, T4, decreased TSH and decreased iodine uptake by radioactivity test. Okay, So, this test is basically differentiating this form from your Graves disease, wherein there is an active radio iodine uptake. Later on in the disease process, hypothyroidism will come and the T3-T4 will fall with a raised TSH. Now, there is an increased risk of developing other autoimmune disease in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. For example, type 1 diabetes, mellitus, autoimmune adrenalitis, SLE, myasthenia gravis, Jogren syndrome, etc. There is also an increased risk of development of extra nodal marginal zone B-cell lymphoma within the thyroid gland. Very important MCQ. Why is it so? Because there is so much of proliferation of the lymphoid cells that this polyclonal population might have some or the other kind of a hit or a mutation and might change into a monoclonal population. So the most common kind of lymphoma developing is the extranodal marginal zone B cell lymphoma. Now some are also associated with uh, papillary carcinoma thyroid but this is just a postulation and it is not yet proven. With this, we complete the discussion of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now we are going to discuss about subacute lymphocytic or painless thyroiditis. So it is a painless thyroiditis and it is a presumed autoimmune disease. So as I already told you that uh, subacute lymphocytic thyroiditis, also called as lymphocytic thyroiditis simply, it is actually uh, regarded as the initial stage of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is at that stage when uh, the, the evidence of, of parenchymal damage is very less or limited and uh, usually uh, uh, the T3, T4 uh, levels are normal. So the patient is euthyroid in cases of lymphocytic thyroiditis. So lymphocytic thyroiditis can be regarded as an initial phase of Hashimoto's also. Most patients of lymphocytic thyroiditis, they have circulating antithyroid peroxidase, thus proving their immune nature. Now, similar disease process, just like this lymphocytic thyroiditis or the painless thyroiditis, it is also seen in postpartum uh, women, in approximately 5% postpartum women. And this is also called as postpartum thyroiditis. So, a postpartum thyroiditis is nothing but lymphocytic thyroiditis which is occurring postpartum in women. Now, there is a limited evidence of parenchymal damage if you compare it with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Usually, it is affecting the women of middle-aged now again remember, uh, there can be a transient hyperthyroid phase followed by hypothyroidism. Okay, And remember at the end there will be resolution with return to your thyroid condition in case of lymphocytic thyroiditis. Looking at the morphology of lymphocytic thyroiditis, grossly the thyroid is mild symmetrically enlarged. The term symmetrical enlargement is very important because it is denoting autoimmune nature. And uh, the, the thyroid is grossly normal, it is not hyperplastic. Microscopically, if you see, there will be a lymphocytic infiltration which was also present in Hashimoto's. There will be large germinal centers which was also present in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But very important, there is a patchy disruption and collapse of thyroid follicles. Okay, The evidence of parenchymal damage is very much limited. Fibrosis okay, and Hartel cell metaplasia or oncocytic change, it is not seen in lymphocytic. This was a component of Hashimoto's only. Okay, So remember, the initial phase of Hashimoto's thyroiditis is regarded as lymphocytic thyroiditis and over here there is no fibrosis or Hartel cell metaplasia which was very much prominent in Hashimoto's thyroiditis because this Hartel cell metaplasia is a reaction to the uh, prolonged damage that is taking place uh, to the thyroid follicular cells. Germinal centers, they are few. Oncocytic changes, if present, is very less and focal. Follicular atrophy is again not seen. Fibrosis is very mild or they are absent in case of lymphocytic thyroiditis. Coming to the next type of uh, thyroiditis, also called as the granulomatous thyroiditis, it is also known as de Kervain's thyroiditis. It is much less frequent than Hashimoto's thyroiditis and again it is involving women more than men of middle age. Now, the prognosis of granulomatous thyroiditis is very simple. 
uh, it is usually hypothesized that it is triggered by some kind of viral infection. So majority patients are having a history of upper respiratory tract infection just before the onset of thyroiditis. The disease is seasonal, mainly reaching peak in the summer. So what happens that the virus induced host damage Okay, the virus actually the virus infection induces the cytotoxic T lymphocyte okay to act against the thyroid antigen and this cytotoxic T lymphocyte damages the thyroid follicles. Now the immune response in is virus initiated and it is not self-perpetuating. That means it is not going to go forward by its own. So ultimately the disease process is going to resolve and it is a self-limited process. So you don't have to treat for this condition. Morphology, remember. It, uh, the process is involving the entire gland okay and sometimes you might have asymmetric involvement the gland is enlarged to twice its normal size and in the advanced stage the involved area might become firm histologically if you see it, the changes are very patchy it is not diffusely present throughout the thyroid and it depends on the stage of the disease so in the early inflammatory phase if you see there is a neutrophilic infiltration forming microapsis. so this is the early phase of granulomatous thyroiditis in the later phase of the granulomatous thyroiditis you will see the characteristic appearance characterized by aggregates of lymphocytes activated macrophages plasma cells associated with collapsed and damaged thyroid follicles now multinuclear giant cells uh, encloses pools of colloid and therefore it gives a granulomatous appearance so in the granulomatous thyroiditis you can see the multinuclear giant cells along with the chronic inflammatory cells and fibrosis as well remember granuloma is not very distinct in granulomatous thyroiditis and caseous necrosis is consistently absent over here if you look at the clinical features of granulomatous thyroiditis it is the most common cause of thyroid pain which is an mcq now the inflammation of the thyroid and hyperthyroidism is quite transient over here it diminishes in two to six weeks of time so over here you will see that there is an increased t3 t4 and decreased tsh but after six to eight weeks all the thyroid function tests they will return back to normal typically it is affecting the middle-aged women and uh, she has a history of sore throat painful deglutition and marked tenderness often associated with fever and malice so what are the other granulomatous condition associated with thyroid uh, it is palpation thyroiditis, tuberculosis, primary tuberculosis of the thyroid gland, sarcoidosis, mycosis, as well as post-operative necrotizing granulomas. So if you look at this particular diagram, if you see, you can appreciate in this uh, classical diagram, uh, multiple multinuclear giant cells. There is a lymphocytic infiltration also over here. You can see the colloid uh, that has broken and has released the colloid over here. So multiple granulomas centered in the thyroid follicles can be appreciated from this diagram. Now we will come to the last type of thyroiditis called as acute thyroiditis. Now this acute thyroiditis is usually they are of infectious nature and they may be associated with acute infections of the upper aerodigestive tract like pharyngitis and tonsillitis. Now it tends to affect the malnourished infant and the debilitated elderly as well as immunocompromised patient. So the causative organisms include Streptococcus hemolyticus, Staphylococcus aureus, pneumococcus. They are the most common organisms involved. Other organisms include the gram-negative bacteria, fungi, particularly the candida and pneumocystis. Now viral infection is usually, it can happen but it is rare and usually CM cytomegalovirus infection has been implicated in patients with HIV. Now morphologically the main changes in acute thyroiditis that you will expect it is neutrophilic infiltration and tissue necrosis. Sometimes non-suppurative and suppurative forms exist and the latter sometimes evolves into an abscess. Now the best method to confirm the diagnosis of acute thyroiditis is to go for fine needle aspiration biopsy with smear cytological examination and cultures. With this, we have completed in details about the thyroiditis. Thank you very much for watching this lecture. Please do not forget to share and subscribe.